Hello, my friends. Today is January 20th, and this is Markets Weekly. What a great week in markets, right? S&P 500 closing at record highs. And, of course, I don't think we're done yet. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today, I want to talk about three things. First, I want to look at some of the recent economic data and suggest that we may be seeing signs of a re-acceleration of the U.S. economy. Secondly, there's a very interesting report in Bloomberg uh, saying that banking regulators in the U.S. are thinking about forcing banks to tap the Fed's discount window at least once a year. Let's talk about what's driving that and how it might impact monetary policy, specifically quantitative tightening and the BTFP facility. And lastly, I want to go over some of the things that I heard from big bank earnings. So last week, we got a bunch of big banks reporting earnings, and big banks are involved in all aspects of the U.S. economy, so they are a very good source of of information. Let's listen to what they're saying about the U.S. consumer. Okay, first, starting with the economic data. So let's level set a bit first. So broadly speaking, uh, people estimate the trend growth rate of the U.S. economy to be 1.8%. And last year was a very good year for the U.S. economy. So the first and second quarter, we grew above 2%. Third quarter, we grew at a bonkers 4.9%. And the fourth quarter data isn't in yet. Many people have been speculating that the fourth quarter would be relatively weak because part of the strength of the third quarter is due to people pulling forward uh, their expenditures. So the Atlanta Fed has this very interesting program called Atlanta Fed Now, which is a GDP nowcast. What it does is that it takes the latest data releases and uses it to estimate where GDP will print for the quarter. Now, if you look at the path of the Atlanta Fed Now GDP nowcast for fourth quarter 2023, you'll see that it started out relatively low, but over the past few weeks, it's been steadily rising. Now, it's rising because the data has surprised to the upside. For example, as we all know, the U.S. consumer uh, consumer spending is a huge part of the U.S. economy. So one measure of U.S. consumer spending is retail sales. The past week, we got retail sales data, and it was good. So first, it showed acceleration from the prior period, and secondly, it printed comfortably above estimates. The U.S. consumer continues to spend. And one reason it can, they can continue to spend is because they still have jobs. So many people are looking at the labor market and worried that, you know, are we able to sustain these uh, multi-decade low unemployment rates? And are we able to sustain a wage growth that continues to be above pre-pandemic pace? So right now, wage growth is about 5%. Now, one of the data points that we can look at in the labor market as a leading indicator is initial claims. So in the U.S., when you lose your job, what you will usually do is you go to your local state unemployment office and you file an unemployment claim because that's how you can get some unemployment insurance money. Now, initial claims this past week was was really low. Now, if you look at a broader time series of this, you'll notice that it was looking pretty stable around a relatively low level, and now it looks like it's trending downward, and that could suggest some strength in the labor market. Now, one other way to look at the state of the U.S. economy is to look at consumer sentiment. So the University of Michigan does this consumer uh, confidence survey, and it's basically a survey that asks consumers, how are you feeling about your financial situation and that of the economy? Now, consumer sentiment index is still lower than the highs in prior years, but if you look at it, you can see that it's steadily rising, and that shouldn't be surprising. Now, people continue to have jobs, wages continue to grow, inflation is moderating, and interest rates are coming down. And of course, the stock market is surging. So that all in all seems to be pointing to improving consumer sentiment, which of course can suggest that going forward, consumers might be more confident and more comfortable spending. Now, the big change this year compared to the last is that the Fed is expected to keep cutting rates. And so one potential path for a reacceleration of the U.S. economy is to see these interest rate sensitive sectors um, reaccelerate. And as we know, mortgage rates have been coming down the past few weeks, but if you look at 
housing starts, single family housing starts, you'll notice that although they declined last month, the trend is solidly upward. And as mortgage rates continue the trend lower, uh, maybe the U.S. housing market reaccelerates, and of course, that's going to be a boost to GDP because when you build a house, you got to hire a lot of people, you got to buy a lot of materials, you got to buy appliances, and so forth. So it's very stimulative to the goods sector of the of the economy. So going forward, uh, if interest rate sensitive sectors you know, reaccelerate, we could have actually a pretty good year, and that remains to be seen. So um, all in all, definitely don't really see any signs of recession. What I do see though is signs of reacceleration and let's follow this more closely going forward. Okay, the second thing that I wanna talk about is this really interesting report from Bloomberg uh, saying that banking regulators in the US want to force banks to tap the Fed's discount window uh, once a year. Um, and now, first of all, let's talk about why that might be the case. Well, this is probably the case in response to what happened last March. So as we know, last March, Silicon Valley Bank failed and it caused a panic in the regional banks. Now, at the time, Silicon Valley Bank had tremendous amounts of treasuries and agency MBS. Now, many were wondering, why don't they just borrow from the Fed? After all, it's not a credit problem. All the stuff they have is money good. It's more of a interest rate risk problem. Well, it turns out Silicon Valley Bank actually wasn't set up to use the discount window. So um, they basically uh, had a liquidity, liquidity run that was very fast, borrowed from the home loan banks, tried to borrow from the Fed, but wasn't set up and, and so wasn't able to do that in time, which is kind of ridiculous when you think about it. The Fed, obviously, as the central bank, is the lender of last resort, and yet there are many banks, it seems, who don't even know how to tap the discount window. So the regulators realized that this was ridiculous and are forcing banks to basically be ready operationally uh, to tap the discount window in case they run into liquidity problems, um, which is, I think, a really good idea. Now, this is also going to have some implications on monetary policy. Oh, first off, uh, secondly, of course, now traditionally there is a stigma in tapping the discount window because the thinking is that uh, if a bank is tapping the discount window, they're really desperate, and so they're in big trouble, and so nobody, no bank wants to telegraph that. Now, part of the effort that the Fed has been making, not just now, but over the past recent years, has been to destigmatize the discount window to make banks comfortable borrowing uh, from it whenever they have trouble. That way, um, they will be, that way, if they feel more comfortable borrowing from it, it's less likely that they will be in trouble. And we saw this in March 2020 as well. March 2020, the Fed basically forced all the huge banks to borrow from the discount window, even though they didn't need to, and publicly tell everyone that they were borrowing from the discount window, trying to lessen some of the stigma. Uh, it doesn't seem to have worked that well, but maybe it will work better going forward. Um, but anyway, going to the monetary policy implications of this. So uh, this, has, this is going to have reasonable implications on both the BTFP facility and quantitative tightening. So as we talked about in a prior episode, the bank term funding program is basically lending to banks at uh, a very low rate. Banks are basically being able to borrow uh, for free. And that facility is seeing increasing popularity. Uh, participation in that is surging. Now, you don't really know why banks are doing this, though. Many people guess that it's uh, just to do some kind of arbitrage. But if you are a regulator, you can't really just say this, we're just giving these guys free money and so we gotta shut it down. When you're, when you're a regulator and you're seeing increased participation in one of your liquidity facilities, in the back of your mind, you have to also think that maybe some people out there really, really need this. Now, I don't think that's the case, but when you're a regulator, you gotta be conservative. And so when you're thinking about whether or not you should renew this facility, which is set to expire in March, well, you don't want to um, cut off the people who might actually need it. Then you're just causing problems for yourself. But on the other hand, you don't want to be seen as giving this uh, a lot of free money to the banking sector. So it seems like a good way to solve this dilemma is to reemphasize that you have this other facility here called the discount window that any bank that really needs liquidity can borrow from it. You are encouraging them to use it. 
and potentially, potentially in the future, might adjust the rate to make it a bit more attractive too. So it seems like regulators are emphasizing the discount window uh, as a way to um, ease the transition away from the BTFP for any banks that might actually be borrowing from the BTFP because they need it. And of course, I don't think there are any, but I, I don't know, there are thousands of banks. So the announcement of this discount window facility, in my mind, uh, pretty much seals the fate of the BTFP facility. And you can listen to very smart people like John Pompeo, who used to be uh, John Pompeo, who used to be work at the FDIC. He comes away with a similar take. Um, but this move towards desigmatizing the discount window is going to have big implications on the path of quantitative tightening as well. So right now, the Fed is shrinking their balance sheet and uh, drawing reserves out of the banking system. Now, the, bank wants to sh the Fed wants to shrink their balance sheet, but they also want to be cautious to make sure the banking system has enough reserves, uh, the quote-unquote lowest comfortable level of reserves that many Fed people are pondering over, but no one knows for sure. Uh, John Williams of the New York Fed recently had a paper where he comes up with this economic model, guessing where it is, and you have other people who have their models and methods of knowing as well. The bottom line is the Fed is you know, shrinking its balance sheet, but it doesn't know how far it can go, and that's a big problem. But if they have the discount window that is unstigmatized and everyone knows how to use, it's much less of a problem. Because at the point where the Fed might potentially be shrinking their balance sheet too much, then a bank, any bank that needs reserves can just turn around and borrow from the Fed. So the more people, the more banks that are comfortable and set up to use the discount window, the less the Fed has to worry about uh, shrinking their balance sheet too much. And that gives the Fed a lot more room to conduct quantitative tightening. Now, I don't know if this discount window initiative is going to be in time for uh, this round of QT, but going forward though, I think this gives the Fed a lot more flexibility to shrink their balance sheet. It will be possible to significantly shrink their balance sheet if they have this destigmatization of the discount window uh, ready or successfully do that. Okay, the last thing that I wanna talk about is all the information we got from the big banks. So big banks have tremendous information on the economy. You know, a lot of people bank with them, get their loans from them, and the big banks, of course, see credit card data. So what are the big banks saying? The message seems to be one of normalization. So uh, the Bank of America is one of my favorite banks when it comes to this because they provide a lot of good graphs that they see from their defaults and from their credit card spending. So what the Bank of America data is showing that uh, during the pandemic, we have a surge in spending as people had a lot of money and so forth. And now that surge in spending is plateauing towards growth rates that were consistent with, with how things were pre-pandemic. Basically, you have a normalization in consumer activity. Now, the Bank of America looks at their consumer balances and notes that although consumer balances, so their checking deposit balances, have gone down from their highs, they are still significantly higher than pre-pandemic levels. And so Bank of America has a pretty upbeat look view on the consumers. Now, when you look at credit quality, though, they also have very interesting charts on consumer credit quality and commercial credit quality. And you can see that overall, although um, defaults and charge-offs have ticked up slightly over the past few months, they, they still very much remain within historical ranges. And many banks describe this as normalization. We are, were at a very uh, historically low level of defaults and losses during the pandemic, and now we're going back to historically normal levels, and that makes total sense to me. Now, when we listen to what JP Morgan is saying, they're saying basically uh, the same thing. Uh, they, they feel that the consumer is fine, and what they're seeing in their data is just a normalization of spending activity uh, to pace, paces that were in line with how things were pre-pandemic. I will note, though, that JP Morgan was slightly um, more cautious on consumer balances. So from their perspective, they get the sense that uh, a lot of the quote-unquote excess savings have been spent. So going forward, uh, they want to see how things will be for, um, for the consumer. But 
the takeaway that I get from this and consistent with other measures of data that I'm looking at uh, is that basically we have rising default rates, but to levels that were pace to pace and rate that is prevailing pre-pandemic and consumer spending moderating to pre-pandemic levels as well. Uh, basically just normalization, nothing to be worried about. And of course, as we discussed earlier, there is a potential that that could reaccelerate. Now, one last thing that I would note about bank earnings is that there were some people noting that bank earnings were low. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is that the FDIC uh, basically forced all the banks to shoulder some of the rescue costs of SBB through a special FDIC charge, and that had a big impact on bank earnings. <clears throat> but that's a one-off thing that we all knew were coming. And um, yeah, that's all I prepared for this week. Um, if you're interested in my thoughts, check out my blog at fedguy.com. And of course, um, if you're interested in learning more about macro and markets, check out my courses at centralbanking101.com. Talk to you guys next week.